Hey, you internet. It's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes. We probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings segments. And today's topic comes to us from longtime friend of the channel and frequent commenter, Crafty Spirit. Crafty asked if I could do a video on Tal Elmar. Tal Elmar is the protagonist of an excerpt of a story published in The Peoples of Middle-earth. Tolkien worked on this story idea in the 1950s, so around the same time that The Lord of the Rings was being published. And while Tal Elmar doesn't crack the top 10 most important characters in Tolkien's mythology, he does hold a very special place because Tal Elmar's story takes place in the Second Age. Now, The Silmarillion details the major events of the Second Age, but that book focuses on elves and Numenorians. There are very few named humans who are not Numenorians mentioned in the Second Age. I give you Tal Elmar, a man from Middle-earth, not a Numenorian. And we get to see through Tal Elmar's eyes how the people of Middle-earth view the Numenorians in the Second Age. Spoiler alert! Uh, they're not fans. It's compelling. And since it doesn't have an ending, it makes me, for one, wonder what Tolkien had in mind for Tal Elmar's ultimate fate. Let's start with a little background. Here's what we know. As I mentioned, this story takes place in the Second Age. But even Tolkien isn't sure of the exact date of these events. In one of his notes, he writes... The object of the Numenorians is to occupy this land and make a settlement to threaten the king, Sauron. Or is this while Sauron is absent in Numenor? In other words, Tolkien hasn't decided whether Sauron is still in Middle-earth at the time of this story. I think this tale takes place at some point between Arpharazon becoming king of Numenor in 3255 and the downfall of Numenor in 3319. That's your range. So late in the Second Age. Tolkien is also unsure of where the story is taking place. In another note, he writes, The place is on an estuary of Isen or Morthond. So Tolkien wants this to take place near the coast. Makes sense, since it's going to involve Numenorians arriving by ship. But the river Isen is a fair distance from the Morthond. It definitely affects the geography. For reasons I'll go into later, I think this story makes more sense if it's placed on the river Isen. And frankly, at a time before Arpharazon takes Sauron captive. But enough preamble, here's Tolkien's description of Tal Elmar and his father, Hazad. In the days of the Dark Kings, when a man could still walk dryshod from the rising of the sun to the sea of its setting. There lived in the fenced town of his people in the green hills of Agar, an old man by name Hazard Longbeard. Two prides he had, in the number of his sons, seventeen in all, and in the length of his beard, five feet without stretching. But his joy in his beard was the greater, for it remained with him, and was soft and ruly to his hand, whereas his sons, for the most part, were gone from him, and those that remained, or came ever nigh, were neither gentle nor ruly. They were indeed much as Hazard himself had been in the days of his youth, tough, harsh-tongued, heavy-handed, and quick to violence. Save one only, and he was the youngest. Tall Elmar Hazard, his father named him, he was yet but eighteen years of age, and lived with his father, and the two of his brothers next elder. He was tall and white-skinned, and there was a light in his grey eyes that would flash to fire if he were wroth. And though that happened seldom, and never without great cause, it was a thing to remember and beware of. Those who had seen that fire called him Flint Eye, and respected him, whether they loved him or no. For Tal Elmar might seem, among that sturdy folk, slender-built and lacking in the strength of leg and neck that they praised. But a man that strove with him soon found him strong beyond guess, 
and sudden and swift, hard to grapple and harder to elude. A fair voice he had, which made even the rough tongue of that people more sweet to hear. But he spoke not over much. Indeed, tall Elmar labored hard and at menial tasks, being but the youngest of an old man, who had little wealth left save his beard and a repute for wisdom. But strange to say in that town, he served his father willingly and loved him, more than all his brothers in one, and more than was the want of any sons in that land. Indeed, it was most often on his father's behalf that the flint flash was seen in his eyes. So Tall Elmar is the youngest of 17 sons. Does that mean there's also a similar number of daughters? Who knows? In any case, it's a big family. But at this point, Tall Elmar and two of his brothers are the only ones still living with their aging father, Hazad. And Tal Elmar loves his father dearly, apparently gets into fights defending his father's name. But note that Tal Elmar looks physically different from the rest of the people living in the hills of Agar. He is tall, slender, fair-skinned, and as the story tells us later, fair-haired. Whereas his neighbors and the rest of his family are typically short, stocky, dark-haired people. Why is that the case? It's because of his grandmother who we learn about in this passage. Hazad loved his youngest son dearly in return for his love, yet even more for another cause which he kept in his heart, that his face and his voice reminded him of another that he long had missed. For Hazad also had been the youngest son of his mother, and she died in his boyhood, and she was not of their people. Such was the tale that he had overheard, not openly spoken indeed, for it was held no credit to the house. She came of the strange folk, hateful and proud, of which there was rumor in the Westlands, coming out of the East, it was said. Fair, tall, and flint-eyed they were, with bright weapons made by demons in the fiery hills. Slowly they were thrusting towards the shores of the sea, driving before them the ancient dwellers in the lands. Not without resistance. There were wars on the east marches, and since the older folk were yet numerous, the incomers would at times suffer great loss and be flung back. Indeed, little had been heard of them in the hills of Agar far to the west for more than a man's life since that great battle of which songs were yet sung. In the valley of Ishmalog it had been fought, the wise in lore told, and there a great host of the fell folk had been ambushed in a narrow place and slaughtered in heaps. And in that day many captives were taken, for this had been no affray on the borders or fight with advance guards. A whole people of the fell folk had been on the move with their wains and their cattle and their women. Now Buldar, father of Hazad, had been in the army of the North King that went to the muster of Ishmalog. And he brought back from the war a wound and a sword and a woman. So there's a lot to take in from that quote. Set me down a research rabbit hole, frankly. <laughs> First of all, let's note the elephant in the room. This culture takes slaves. And as we'll see later, they are of the opinion that Numenorians do the same. Tall Elmar's grandfather, Buldar, fought in the battle against the, quote, fell folk from the east, who are fair, tall, and flint-eyed. And they wield, quote, bright weapons made by demons in the fiery hills. Buldar's people crushed the fell folk in the valley of Ishmalog, and Buldar returned home with a captive, Tall Elmar's grandmother. All right, this is speculation on my part. Tolkien doesn't spell this out. But here's my interpretation of these events. Remember, the first potential location Tolkien mentioned for the hills of Agar was an estuary of the Aizen River. Let's assume for a second that that's where this society lives. And they're short, stocky, and dark-haired. This almost certainly means they're descendants of the House of Haladin, AKA the House of Haleth. I've done a video on the houses of the Edain and on Lady Haleth, but briefly, with some exceptions, there were three houses, three lineages of the Edain, the house of Beor, the house of Haleth, and the house of Hador. 
The houses of Bayor and Hador fought for the good guys in the War of Wrath at the end of the First Age, and so were rewarded with longer lifespans, access to greater knowledge, and their own island, hence Numenorians. The House of Haleth was all but wiped out at the end of the First Age, though some of their descendants became the Dunlendings, who thousands of years later would have a large part to play in the Battle of Helm's Deep. I think our residents of the Hills of Agar are proto-Dunlendings. Here's a quote about them from the Return of the King Appendices. Holy alien, or only remotely akin, was the language of the Dunlendings. These were a remnant of the peoples that had dwelt in the vales of the White Mountains in ages past. The dead men of Dunharrow were of their kin. But in the dark years, Others had removed to the southern dales of the Misty Mountains, and thence some had passed into the Empty Lands as far north as the Barrow Downs. From them came the men of Bree. But long before, these had become subjects of the North Kingdom of Arnor, and had taken up the Westron tongue. Only in Dunland did men of this race hold to their old speech and manners, a secret folk, unfriendly to the Dunedain, hating the Rohirrim. Of their language, nothing appears in this book save the name Forgoil, which they gave to the Rohirrim, meaning straw heads, it is said. We see there a link between the Dunlendings and the men of Dunharrow, the Oathbreakers, who are also from the Second Age. Dunharrow is in the White Mountains, near to Rohan in the Third Age, and we're reminded of the Dunlendings' antipathy for the Rohirrim in the Third Age mostly due to their dispute over Rohan. I don't think it's a big leap to think that the fell folk, who included Tal Elmar's grandmother, were proto-Rohirrim, Northmen. Northmen were kin of the third house of the Edain, the house of Hador. But they were not Numenorians. They stayed in Middle-earth. In the Second Age, they lived primarily near the Vales of the Anduin, which, while west of Mordor and the Sea of Rune, would still have been considered the east by folks living near the Eisen River. Hence, it would make sense for the fell folk to be seen as coming out of the east. As for this battle at the Valley of Ishmilog, we're told that there was an ambush set in a narrow place, a valley. And it wasn't an army that got ambushed. It was a society, a group migrating west with wagons and cattle. My guess this battle took place in the Gap of Rohan. Buldar's people could have followed the Aizen from the sea to the Gap of Rohan, where we later see Isengard set up and laid their trap. As we know from Lord of the Rings, the Gap of Rohan is one of the few routes through the mountains that doesn't involve climbing. And if you got a bunch of wagons, that's probably the route you take. So it seems fitting that this battle would occur in the same region that descendants of those same two factions will be fighting over for thousands of years. One last bit of nerdly research involves the bright weapons made by demons in the fiery hills. What, uh, did, did Balrog set up a weapon shop? Uh, no, no, as it happens, I found a quote in the Peoples of Middle-earth that I think explains this line. In the Second Age, the Northmen and the Dwarves had an alliance. When Morgoth fell and Engband was destroyed, hence at the end of the First Age, hosts of the orcs fled eastwards, seeking homes. They were now masterless and without any general leadership, but they were well-armed and very numerous, cruel, savage, and reckless in assault. In the battles that followed, the dwarves were outnumbered, and though they were the most redoubtable warriors of the speaking peoples, they were glad to make an alliance with men. The men with whom they were thus associated were for the most part akin in race and language with the tall and mostly fair-haired people of the House of Hador, the most renowned and numerous of the Edain, who were allied with the Eldar in the War of the Jewels. These men, it seems, had come westward until faced by the Great Greenwood, and then had divided, some reaching the Anduin and passing thence northward up the Vales, some passing between the north eaves of the Wood and the Arid Mithrin. Only a small part of this people already very numerous and divided into many tribes, had then passed on into Eriador, and so come at last to Beleriand. They were brave and loyal folk, true-hearted, haters of Morgoth and his servants. 
and at first had regarded the dwarves askance, fearing that they were under the shadow, as they said. But they were glad of the alliance, for they were more vulnerable to the attacks of the orcs. They dwelt largely in scattered homesteads and villages, and if they drew together into small townships, they were poorly defended, at best by dikes and wooden fences. Also, they were lightly armed, chiefly with bows, for they had little metal, and the few smiths among them had no great skill. These things the dwarves amended in return for one great service that men could offer. They were tamers of beasts, and had learned the mastery of horses, and many were skilled and fearless riders. These would often ride far afield as scouts, and keep watch on movements of their enemies. And if the orcs dared to assemble in the open for some great raid, they would gather great force of horsed archers and surround them and destroy them. In these ways, the alliance of dwarves and men in the north came early in the Second Age to command great strength, swift in attack, and valiant, and well protected in defense. And there grew up in that region between dwarves and men respect and esteem, and sometimes warm friendship. That quote mentions the connection between the Northmen and the House of Hador, and shows how the dwarves agreed to make metal weapons and armor for the Northmen in exchange for mutual defense against the orcs. You can imagine, anyone having to face a Northman wielding a forged weapon might consider the non-human maker of that weapon <laughs> to be an enemy and a demon from the Fiery Hills. Now, that dwarven Northman alliance ended around 1700 of the Second Age, when Sauron first attacked Eriador after having forged the ring. So I think that alliance was long dead by the time of the Battle of Ishmaelon. But those metal weapons and armor were probably passed down through the generations. Venerable artifacts. Though if this battle was such a one-sided affair, I'd think that the Northmen's weapons would become the Dunlending's weapons. Note the last line of that Ishmaelon quote. Buldar brought back from the war a wound and a sword and a woman. Anyway, let's talk about that woman. Tall Elmar's grandmother, her name... Elmar. Hence, Tall Elmar is named after her. This is a really impactful dialogue between Elmar and Buldar, in which she places a curse on Buldar's society. Buldar took her as his wife, for she was beautiful, and having looked on her, he desired no woman of his own folk. He was a man of wealth and power in those days, and did as he would, scorning the scorn of his neighbors. But when his wife, Elmar, had learned at length enough of the speech of her new kin, she said to Buldar on a day, I have much to thank thee for, Lord, but think not ever to get my love so. For thou hast torn me from my own people, and from him that I loved, and from the child that I bore him. For them ever shall I yearn and grieve, and give love to none else. Never again shall I be glad, while I am held captive among a strange folk that I deem base and unlovely. So be it, said Buldar. But it is not to be thought that I should let thee go free, for thou art precious in my sight. And consider well, vain is it to seek to escape from me. Long is the way to the remnant of thy folk, if any still live. And thou wouldst not go far from the hills of Agar, ere thou met death, or a life far worse than shall be thine at my house. Base and unlovely thou namest us, truly, maybe. Yet true is it also that thy folk are cruel and lawless and the friends of demons. Thieves are they, for our lands are ours from of old, which they would wrest from us with their bitter blades. White skins and bright eyes are no warrant for such deeds. Are they not, said she, that neither are thick legs and wide shoulders? Or by what means did ye gain these lands that ye boast of? Are there not, as I hear men say, wild folk in the caves of the mountains, who once roamed here free, ere ye came hither and hunted them like wolves? But I spoke not of rights, but of sorrow and love. If here I must dwell, then dwell I must, as one whose body is in this place at thy will, but my thought far elsewhere. And this vengeance I will have, that while my body is kept here in exile, the lot of all this folk shall worsen, 
and thine most. But when my body goes to the alien earth and my thought is free of it, then in thy kin one shall arise who is mine alone. And with his arising shall come the end of thy people and the downfall of your king. Thereafter, Elmar said no more on this matter, and she was indeed a woman of few words while her life lasted, save only to her children. To them she spoke much when none were by, and she sang to them many songs in a strange fair tongue, but they heeded her not, or soon forgot, save only Hazad, the youngest. And though he was, as were all her children, unlike her in body, he was nearer to her in heart. The songs and the strange tongue he too forgot when he grew up, but his mother he never forgot. Wow, that does not sound like a healthy relationship. And in fact, it may be one of the creepiest in Tolkien's lore, vibes of Aeol the Dark Elf and Arathel. Elmar makes it clear that she hates her circumstance, that she's been torn from a family she loves, and Buldar doesn't care. Her youngest child is Hazad, and his youngest child, who happens to look a lot like Elmar, bears her name. I think it's reasonable to assume that Tal Elmar is the one she prophesizes will arise and bring about the downfall of Buldar's proto-Dunlanding society and their king. Sauron has been in control of much of Middle-earth for a while, and let's not forget the men of Dunharrow were worshipping Sauron around this time. Interestingly, Elmar mentions the wild folk and how Buldar's people stole their lands. That's almost certainly the Druidine, a culture that lived in the White Mountains and we see still living near there during the War of the Ring. That's when their leader, Gan Buri Gan, helps Theoden get to Minas Tirith. So Tal Elmar is now a man of prophecy, destined to take down these proto Dunlandings and Sauron himself in some way. And already, Elmar's prophecy is coming to pass. We get this quote. Even as Elmar had spoken, the people of Agar had waned with the years, what with ill weathers and with pests. And most of all were Buldar and his sons affected. And they had become poor, and other kindreds had taken their power from them. But Hazad knew not of the foreboding of his mother, and in her memory loved tall Elmar, and had so named him at birth. So hard times have come to the hills of Agar, and Buldar's family in particular. One day, tall Elmar and his father go walking on a hillside near the sea, and tall Elmar sees three large ships in the distance, though he confuses their white sails for birds' wings. Then he sees a fourth bird with black wings. Hazad's vision not as good, so he can't see these ships. But when his son mentions the black sails, Hazad takes notice. Is not life here hard enough that when spring is come and winter is over at last, thou must bring a vision out of the black past? Three folk we hold as enemies, the wild men of the mountains and the woods, but these only those who stray alone need fear. The fell folk of the east, but they are yet far away. They are my mother's people, though I doubt not that they would not honor the kinship if they came here with their swords. And the high men of the sea, these indeed we may dread as death. For death they worship and slay men cruelly in honor of the dark. Out of the sea they came, and if they ever had any land of their own ere they came to the west shores, we know not where it may be. Black tales come to us out of the coastlands north and south, where they have now long time established their dark fortresses and their tombs. But thither have they not come since my father's days, and then only to raid and catch men and depart. Now this was the manner of their coming. They came in boats, but not such as some of our folk use that dwell nigh in the great rivers of the lakes for ferrying or fishing. Greater than great houses are the ships of the Gohilig, and they bear store of men and goods, and yet are wafted by the winds, for they spread great cloths like wings to catch the airs, and bind them to tall poles like trees of the forest. Thus they will come to the shore where there is shelter, or as nigh as they may, 
And then they will set forth smaller boats laden with goods and strange things, both beautiful and useful, such as our folk covet. These they will sell to us for small price or give as gifts feigning friendship and pity for our need. And they will dwell a while and spy out the land and the numbers of the folk and then go. And if they do not return, men should be thankful. For if they come again, it is in another guise. In greater numbers they will come then, two ships or more together, stuffed with men and not goods, and ever one of the accursed ships hath black wings, for that is the ship of the dark, and in it they bear away captives packed like beasts, the fairest women and children, or young men unblemished, and that is their end. Some say that they are eaten for meat, and others that they are slain with torment on the black stones in the worship of the dark. Both maybe are true. The foul wings have not been seen in these waters for many a year. But remembering the shadow of fear in the past, I cried out and cry again. Is not our hard life enough without the vision of a black wing upon the shining sea? Hard enough indeed, said Tal Elmar, yet not so hard that I would leave it yet. Come, if what you tell is good sooth, then we should run to the town and warn men and make ready for flight or for defense. That is a sobering memory of Numenorean colonization that Hazard recounts. To his people, the ships with the black sails come to take slaves, just like Buldar took Elmar back in the day. So from their standpoint, Numenorians equal death. He says they haven't been seen for many years. I think that works with the timeline. If this is the time of Arpharazon, about a thousand years earlier, the cities of Pelargir and Umbar were built, became the main ports of the Numenorians, And those cities are nowhere near the Aizen River. So they might have avoided Numenorian attention for a time. Hazad's warning about the Numenorians first coming with gifts, then returning for more sinister motives, is echoed in the Silmarillion. Here's a quote from the Silmarillion regarding some of the first interactions between the Numenorians and the men of Middle-earth. And the lords of Numenor set forth again upon the western shores in the dark years of men, and none yet dared to withstand them. For most of the men of that age that sat under the shadow were now grown weak and fearful, and coming among them, the Numenorians taught them many things. Corn and wine they brought, and they instructed men in the sowing of seed and the grinding of grain, in the hewing of wood and the shaping of stone, and in the ordering of their life, such as it might be in the lands of swift death and little bliss. Then the men of Middle-earth were comforted, and here and there upon the western shores the houseless woods drew back, and men shook off the yoke of the offspring of Morgoth and unlearned their terror of the dark. And they revered the memory of the tall sea kings, and when they had departed they called them gods, hoping for their return. For at that time the Numenorians dwelt never long in Middle-earth, nor made there as yet any habitation of their own. That seems to be in line with the stories that were passed down to Hazad, as does this next quote from the Silmarillion, which references events approximately 1,300 years before our Pharazon's reign. These things took place in the days of tar Kiriatan, the shipbuilder, and of tar Atanamir, his son. And they were proud men, eager for wealth, and they laid the men of Middle-earth under tribute, taking now rather than giving. So to Hazad's eyes, the enemy has returned. In the interest of time, I'm going to sum up the middle section of this tale, then jump ahead to the very intriguing conclusion. Hazad and Tal Elmar go to the town master, Mogru, to warn him about the ships. Mogru doesn't believe them, and we see that he's not a fan of the duo calling them the slave son and your brat. Tal Elmar angrily defends his father's name to Mogru. He then says, It may well be that we are in peril. Therefore you shall come now with us to the hilltop and look with your own eyes. And if you see there ought to warrant it, you shall summon the men to the moot hill. I will be your messenger. Thus they convince Mogru to go look for himself. He sees the ships and commands Tal Elmar to go summon the men. But he also sees an opportunity to get rid of 
Tall Elmar. So he adds another task. Tall Elmar is to go make contact with the Numenorians. Straight from the fields thou shalt go with all speed to the strand. For there the ships, if ships they be, will halt, most likely, and set men ashore. Tidings thou must win there, and spy out well what is afoot. Come not back at all, unless it is with news that will help our counsels. Go, and spare thyself not, I command thee. It is time of peril to the town. Tall Elmar sees the ploy for what it is, but feels obliged to honor the orders of the town master. He gives a final warning to Magru. Maybe I shall return against thy hope. My father, I leave in thy care. If I come, be it with word of peace or with a foe on my heel, then thy mastership will be at an end, and thy life also, if I find that he has suffered any evil or dishonor that thou couldst prevent. Thy knife men and club bearers will not help thee. I will wring thy fat neck with my bare hands if needs be, or I will hunt thee through the wilds to the black pools. All right, Tall Elmar's not fooling around when it comes to his father. And he takes off. We jump to Tall Elmar nearing the beach where the Numenorians have come ashore. It was still morning and more than an hour ere the noon. But when he came under the trees, he halted and took thought and knew that he was shaken with fear. Seldom had he wandered far from the hills of his home and never alone nor deep into the wood, for all his folk dreaded the forest. It was swift for the eye to travel to the shore, but slow for feet, and the distance was greater than it seemed. The wood was dark and unwholesome, for there were stagnant waters between the hills of Agar and the hills of the shoreland, and many snakes lived there. It was silent, too, for though it was spring, few birds built there or even alighted as they sped on to the cleaner land by the sea. There dwelt in the wood also dark spirits that hated men, or so ran the tales of his people. Of snake and swamp and wood demon, tall Elmar thought, as he stood within the shadow. But it needed short thought to come to the conclusion that all three were less peril than to return, with lying excuse, or with none, to the town and its master. So, helped a little perhaps by his pride, he went on. And the thought came to him under the shadow as he sought for a way through swamp and thicket. What do I know, or any of my people, even my father, of these go hillig of the winged boats? It may well be that I, who am a stranger in my own people, should find them more pleasing than Mogru and all others like him. With this thought growing in him, so that at length he felt rather as a man who goes to greet friends and kinsmen than as one who creeps out to spy on dangerous foes. He passed unhurt through the shadowwood and came to the shore hills and began to climb. One hill he chose because bushes clambered up its slope and it was crowned with a dense knot of low trees. To this cover he came and creeping to the further brink he looked down. Out in the midst of the stream, beyond the shoals, three great ships, though Tal Elmar had no such word in his language to name them with, were lying motionless. They were anchored and the sails down. Of the fourth, the black ship, there was no sign. But on the green near the shingles there were tents and small boats drawn up near. Tall men were standing or walking among them. Away on the big boats, tall Elmar could see others on watch. Every now and then he caught a flash as some weapon or arms moved in the sun. He trembled, for the tales of the blades of the cruel men were familiar to his childhood. Tall Elmar looked long, and slowly it came to him how hopeless was his mission. He might look until daylight failed, but he could not count accurately enough for any use the number of men were there. Nor could he discover their purpose or their plans. Even if he had either the courage or the fortune to come past their guards, he could do nothing useful, for he would not understand a word of their language. So Tall Elmar is now spying on the newly arrived Numenorians. But he knows that to accomplish this mission that he was assigned, he's going to have to approach these strangers. And I like that he considers, well, I'm a stranger to my own people. I might prefer the company of these go -hillig. Note that he's afraid to enter the woods, at least in part because of the wood demons, dark spirits that hated men. 
in this part of Middle Earth, I don't think we're talking about Sylvan Elves. I think we're talking about Ents. Okay, we've come to the moment of truth. Time for Tal Elmar to roll the dice. He rose, and as if led or driven, walked openly down the hill and across the long sward to the shingles and the tents. Could he have seen himself, he would have been struck with wonder no less than those who saw him now from the shore. His naked skin, for he wore only a loincloth and little cloak of fur cast back and caught by a thong to his shoulder, glowed golden in the light. His fair hair, too, was kindled, and his step was light and free. Look, cried one of the watchmen to his companion. Do you, do you see what I see? Is it not one of the Eldar of the woods that comes to speak with us? I see indeed, said the other. But if not some phantom from the edge of the coming dark in this land accursed, it cannot be one of the fair. We are far to the south, and none dwell here. Would indeed we were north, away near to the havens. Who knows all the ways of the Eldar, said the watchman. Silence now, he approaches. Let him speak first. So they stood still and made no sign as tall Elmar drew near. When he was some twenty paces away, his fear returned and he halted, letting his arms fall before him and opening his palms outwards to the strangers in a gesture which all men could understand. Then, as they did not move, nor put hand to any weapon so far as he could see, he took courage again and spoke, saying, Hail, men of the sea and the wings, why do you come here? Is it in peace? I am Tal Elmar Uhazad, of the folk of Agar. Who are you? His voice was clear and fair, but the language that he used was but a form of the half-savage language of the men of the dark, as the shipmen called them. The watchman stirred. Elda, he said. The Eldar do not use such a tongue. He called aloud, and at once men tumbled out of the tents. He himself drew forth a sword, while his companion put arrow to bowstring. Before Tal Elmar had even time to feel terror, much less turn and run, happily, for he knew nothing of bows, and would have fallen long before he was out of bowshot, he was surrounded by armed men. They seized him, but not with harsh handling, when they found he was weaponless and submissive, and led him to a tent where sat one in authority. Interesting here, the Numenorians first mistake him for an elf. Then when he starts speaking this unknown language, they quickly change to, like, who is this guy? And they capture him and bring him before the captain. I find it interesting that Tal Elmar isn't familiar with bows. I'd have thought his people would have had that tech. They are definitely behind the times. I've got two quotes left. And since this is near the end of Tolkien's draft, we get a mixture of notes and text. In fact, we lead off this next quote with a note. Tal Elmar feels the language to be known and only veiled from him. The captain says Tal Elmar must be of Numenorean race or of the people akin to them. He must be kindly treated. He guesses that he had been made captive as a babe or born of captives. He is trying to escape to us, he says. A pity he remembers nothing of the language. He will learn. Maybe, but after a long time. If he spoke it now, he could teach us much that would speed our errand and lessen our peril. They make Tall Elmar at last understand their desire to know how many men dwell near. Are they friendly? Are they like he is? The object of the Numenorians is to occupy this land and in alliance with the cruels of the North to drive out the Dark People and make a settlement to threaten the king. Very perceptive captain. He seems to correctly guess that Tal Elmar is the offspring of a captive, one of the cruels of the North, which I think solidifies that we're talking about Northmen. The Numenorians are here to threaten the king, Sauron, and drive out his followers, which of course would include the people of Agar. As the Numenorians lament that Tal Elmar can't speak their language, uh, we get an odd twist. He does, in fact, know their language. This quote opens again with some notes. Tal Elmar could count and understand high numbers, though his language was defective. 
Or does he understand Numenorian? Added subsequently, Eldarin, these were elf friends. He said when he heard the men speak to one another, This is strange, for you speak the language of my long dreams. Yet surely now I stand in my own land and do not sleep. Then they were astonished and said, Why did you not speak so to us before? You spoke like the people of the dark, who are our enemies, being servants of our enemy. And Tal Elmar answered, Because this tongue has only returned to my mind hearing you speak it, and because... How should I have known that you would understand the language of my dreams? You are not like those who spoke in my dreams. Nay, a little like, but they were brighter and more beautiful. Then the men were still more astonished and said, It seems that you have spoken with the Eldar, whether awake or in a vision. Who are the Eldar? said Tal Elmar. That name I did not hear in my dream. If you roam with us, you may perhaps see them. Then suddenly fear and the memory of old tales came upon Tal Elmar again, and he quailed. What would you do with me? he cried. Would you lure me to the black-winged boat and give me to the dark? You, or your kin at least, belong already to the dark, they answered. But why do you speak so of the black sails? The black sails are to us a sign of honor, for they are the fair night before the coming of the enemy. And upon the black are set the silver stars of Elbereth. The black sails of our captain have passed further up the water. Still, Tal Elmar was afraid, because he was not yet able to imagine black as anything but the symbol of the night of fear. But he looked as boldly as he could and answered, Not all my kind. We fear the dark, but we do not love it, nor serve it. At least so do some of us. So does my father. And him, my love, I would not be torn from him, not even to see the Eldar. Alas, they said, your time of dwelling in these hills has come to an end. Here the men of the West have resolved to make their homes, and the folk of the dark must depart or be slain. Note, Tall Elmar offers himself as a hostage. There is no more. At the foot of the page, my father wrote Tal Elmar twice, and his own name twice, and also Tal Elmar in Rovenian. Whoa! Some fascinating stuff there. Tal Elmar can speak Elvish. In his mind, he spoke to elves in his dreams. I'm not sure what this means, except it's got this chosen one vibe. Remember his grandmother's prophecy that one would arise, and with his arising shall come the end of thy people and the downfall of your king. We were told that Elmar sang songs in a strange tongue to young Hazard. Assuming that tongue was Elvish, maybe he passed those songs on, singing young tall Elmar to sleep? The only sticking point to that theory is that the text says, the songs and the strange tongue... He, Hazard, forgot when he grew up, but his mother, he never forgot. So I'm not sure how Tal Elmar learned Elvish. If you've got a theory, uh, please feel free to share it with me in the comments. I appreciate that Tal Elmar is justifiably afraid of being placed aboard the ship with the dark sails, perhaps to be sacrificed. The Numenorians assure him, oh no, no, the black sails are a sign of honor. We're not here to eat you and sacrifice you. But we are here to kill all of your people and take your land. <laughs> oh, well, great. Whew, that's a relief. So I guess I'm a hostage? And that's where the story ends. Where did Tolkien intend for the story to go? I'm not sure, but I can guess a few things. One, no way Tal Elmar abandons his father. So even though he's a hostage of the Numenorians, and they have stated their intent saying, the folk of the dark must depart or be slain. I think Tal Elmar returns to town to save his dad from the coming catastrophe. If this is indeed the time of Ar Farazan's invasion of Middle Earth, though he landed at Umbar, we know it's a fairly quick victory and Sauron is taken captive. That could be the global event that's occurring while Tal Elmar's smaller story is also unfolding. The last words written on the page are very interesting. Tal Elmar in Rovenian. 
Ravenian is nowhere near the Aizen estuary. It means Tall Elmar's going on a quest. I'm guessing that at some point his father, Hazad, dies. Tall Elmar feels alone in the world at being released by the Numenorians. He goes in search of the people of his grandmother. The Northmen lived in the region of Rovanian, along with various elves, including the elves of Greenwood, later Mirkwood. And for one being afraid of the forest, he'd be venturing through a lot of forest land, just might run into a few wood demons, a la Ents. Perhaps he becomes a leader of the Northmen in those days. If you have a fun theory about where Tolkien was taking the story, I'd love to hear it. In any case, thank you so much, Crafty Spirit, for recommending this topic. I really enjoyed researching it. Uh, and I'll talk to everybody next time.